Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the LeadX Leadership Show. I am Kevin Cruz. This is a Friday edition, which means I go off format, non-interview. I go so low to help you to achieve your full potential. I want you to stand out and to get ahead at work. And today, I'm going to be answering questions from business students from June Covington's Leadership and Motivation class at Chico State. And let me start by saying... Professor Covington and to all your great students, I apologize it has taken me this long to get to your questions. Um, I like answering questions. I like helping everybody uh, I, I can. But man, these hit me at the busiest season of my life in probably 30 years, 20 years. I, of course, had the book launch, Great Leaders Have No Rules. It went great. It's going great. But just everything that gets involved with the book launch is uh, crazy. And then, of course, the day job is running LeadX, which I've got to remind everybody, go to leadx.org so you can get tons of book summaries, tons of coaching packs so that you can become better at accountability or giving recognition, and tons of micro learning videos and more, leadx.org. So it's taken me a while to get to these questions. And June, if I missed your students' questions, like if, if they're gone, if the class is over, I apologize, but I'm hoping they can listen to this podcast or see the little transcript we'll put out on social media and still get some value from their questions. Or maybe this will help future students. Well, anyway, let me dive in. The first question comes from Nate Ambrosini. Hello, my name's Nate. I'm interested in asking about culture and leadership. You've built several multi-million dollar companies that have won awards on best place to work. What would you say are the key components to creating a company that has a culture where the employees feel motivated and stay engaged. Nate, that is the right question. That's what it's all about. And when I was young and dumb and in my 20s, my first companies crashed and burned because I did not value leadership and motivation and engagement. But I got some great mentors and I learned and developed. And for the book, We, that I wrote, um, God, I don't even know what how many years ago that was now, a long time ago, <laughs> a dozen years we looked at research from over 10 million employees in 150 countries. And there's like a dozen different drivers of, enga of engagement, things that people do to drive engagement. But again, I'm not, I'm not a professor. I'm not as smart as uh, Professor Covington. I'm just a busy frontline manager. So I asked these researchers, I said, boil it down. You know, just give me a few things I can focus on. And it turns out most of engagement, most of how we feel about work has to do with growth recognition and trust. So growth, we all want to feel like we're learning and advancing and you know doing challenging work. Recognition, we want to feel appreciated for our work. And trust isn't so much about that I trust that my boss is uh, being honest. It's more like future trust. I trust that the company has a bright future because then I will trust, I'll have confidence that my career has a bright future. And so those are the three keys. And into as a manager, as a business owner, to activate these things for growth. I mean, it's it's literally talking every six months to each of my team members about their future career plans and, you know, how their journey here at LeadX uh, is going to support that. Uh, it's talking to them about, you know, what do they want to learn? Is there a conference they want to go to? Is there books they want to read? Is there online courses they want to want to take? When it comes to recognition, I mean, I, uh, I, I do a ton of that. I mean, it, I try to thank people almost every day, even for the little stuff. Uh, I, I believe in gratitude as a number one value that can change your life. Have an attitude of gratitude. And when you have that mindset, it's really easy to catch people doing things right, either thanking them for their effort or thanking them for their achievements. And then finally, when it comes to trust, and this is easier in a startup mode. I mean, we, we are on a crazy mission at LeadX to spark the next 100 million leaders. And we're doing that by creating the world's first AI executive coach. And we're going to release Coach Amanda into the world soon for free so she can transform, you know, 100 million lives. 
Well, people get pretty pumped up about that mission. So it starts with a compelling mission, compelling vision, doing interesting work. And, you know, as a startup, everybody knows the odds of success are, are actually low. The odds of failure are actually high. But whether you're in a big company, a startup company, or on a team, you can continue to paint as optimistic a, a picture as possible for the future. So those are three of them, uh, growth, recognition, and trust. Thanks, Nate. The next question comes from William Curlis, Brooke Sewell, Eduardo Lara Chavez. How have you dealt with breaking the news of failure to a team? And how have you kept up morale after breaking the news to the, to the team? Yeah, that's a great uh, question because I do believe that transparency is a driver of trust, is a driver of engagement. But transparency means giving the bad news with the good news. And one of the ways that makes this easier is if you're always doing it. So if every month or every quarter you're sharing with your team, hey, here's what, what the team did well this month. Here's where we fell down. Here's where we exceeded our goals. Here's where we have to try harder. And it will just kind of create this culture and rhythm of, of course, we're going to get good and bad news all along the way as we zig and zag towards eventual success. Having said that, some failures are harder to, to, to share than others. And probably the hardest thing of all is when you have to do layoffs. I mean, that's, there's no hiding behind that failure. And in my career, I mean, I've had to let people go from time to time, but there was one time uh, back in, I think it was the, the year 2000 where we had a uh, uh, <laughs> long time ago, uh, youngins, <laughs> um, but we had, there was a tech boom very much like there is right now. And we had taken on a bunch of venture capital. We were racing to grow, getting ready to, to do an IPO. The stock market crashed, which meant we couldn't do our IPO and we were running out of money. And like overnight, we had to like lay off a third of the company. And basically, when you have to give bad news like that, well, first of all, when you give the bad news to the people it affects, like, hey, you know, um, we've got to let you go. We have to do layoffs. My best advice on that is, you, the, the sooner you can just say it, the better. You know, don't meander, don't wind around, don't confuse people like, why am I here? Why, why have we been talking for 15 minutes? What's Kevin getting at? The sooner you can say, hey, I'm really sorry, but we're doing a round of layoffs and today is your last day at work. The sooner you can just rip that Band-Aid off and get that statement out, the better. And then you shift on, their, their mind's gonna be racing. So there's not a whole lot you wanna get into at that time. But you then want to say what happens next. And so for someone who's being let go, it's like, you know, you're going to have until the end of the day to pack up your stuff. Uh, you're going to be given X number of weeks of severance. Uh, your benefits continue until the end of the month. And then you can go on COBRA. Um, I'm, uh, here's information in this letter that explains it all. And I want to set up a phone call with you in the days ahead to help you to you know, answer any other questions and most important to help you find your next great opportunity. So you rip that bandaid off and you tell them like what happens next. Now, the hard talk, I think what you're getting at is now it's been done. What do you say at the end of that day or the next morning or whatever it is to the 70% of team members who had been so gung ho about that future, that bright future, uh, you know, that team, you've just now fired a bunch of their friends uh, their budgets have gotten killed. Their their trust in the future has been shattered. What do you say to them? And again, you go to full transparency. So you let them, they're going to have questions about um, uh, like what happened and what happens next. So the what happened is you explain, hey, listen, here's all these things we were working on and we were planning on. And here's where we screwed up. Here's my mistake. And because of that, to save the company so that we don't go out of business, we had to do this thing. And it's, you know, X number of people we had to let go or whatever the bad news is. We had to shut down that project. And then you immediately say with as much confidence as you can, what's going to happen in the future. Now, if you're doing layoffs, you make sure you do you, you do all of them at once. You don't want to be like a month later, you lay off two more people. A month after that's one more people. That's death because then everybody's going to be looking for a job figuring their time will come. So you explain like, look, we, we, we swallowed the hard medicine today. We did the very painful stuff. We do not expect that we're going to have to do any more cutbacks 
um, moving forward, there's no guarantees, but we think that this is it. And here's why. Here's whatever it is. How much cash is in the bank? Here's the big project that's coming in next week. Yes, we killed these two projects, but we ha- we did it so we could save these four projects that are more important than ever before. You know, it's like, hey, you are more important than ever before because you are our path forward and your projects are more important because you are our path forward. And we're going to get through this recession or this bad period. And we look forward to the day where we can, you know, hire and grow again. And hopefully some of our friends will be um, willing to come back uh, in the future. Another question from Sarah Morcott. I'm interested in leader member exchange theory which focuses on interactions between leaders and their followers. Where in your professional experience have you observed a positive interaction between leaders and followers and what effect did this have on the leader member relationship? Okay, Sarah, I'm going to pause this recording and I'm going to Google leader member exchange theory. All right, hold on. Don't go anywhere. Okay, I'm back. And Sarah, I was just joking. Of course, I knew that the leader member exchange LMX theory is a relationship based approach to leadership that focuses on the two way dyadic relationship between leaders and followers. Footnote one, it suggests that leaders develop an exchange with each of their subordinates and that the quality of these leader member exchange relationships influence subordinates responsibility decisions and access to resources and performance. Relationships are based on trust and respect and are often emotional relationships that extend beyond the scope of employment. Yeah, that was Wikipedia. Okay, this is very cool. So I didn't have those fancy words, Sarah, but in my brand new book, Great Leaders Have No Rules, which I know is already on your bookshelf, I've got a chapter that says that's called Play Favorites. And the whole chapter, if I could rewrite the book, I would call that chapter Leader Member Exchange Theory because... Absolutely, this is correct, where the most unfair thing you can do is to treat everybody on your team alike. No, no, no. You want to individualize your leadership approach, and you do need to recognize, you do need to play favorites in, in, in with the most talented people. Why should the top performing sales rep get paid the same and be treated the same as a low performing sales rep? Why should the punishment be the same for the retail worker who's shown up on time every day for 10 years, but then shows up 15 minutes late versus the person who just started their job and they've been 15 minutes late five days in a row. Um, It's the same infraction, but the way you would handle that situation uh, is different. How do you decide? And this is real world. I mean, even in a small business, you've got 10 people in your entire company and there's only two offices with windows. You take one, who gets the other if all the other people are at the same level? You got to pick somebody. Uh, who, who gets some, you know, the new laptop when you can't afford to give everybody a new laptop? So you have to make choices. You have to play some favorites. But the key here is you don't play favorites because you like the person and they play golf with you or they're in your fantasy sports league or you guys talk about uh, um, The Bachelor every week. That's favoritism. That's cronyism. You don't want that. You're playing favorites based on performance. And you, you, when people challenge you on that, you play favorites around here. You say, yes, I do. Would you like to learn how to become a favorite? I mean, that's the challenge back. So I've been ranting, Sarah, and I don't think I've been answering uh, your question. Where in your professional experience have you observed a positive interaction? And what effect did this have on the leader member relationship? Well, so I, I mean, I think I do this all the time. Now, I'm a type A introvert. I don't naturally like go hang out with people. I'm not real social and all that. But, you know, throughout my my last 20 years as a leader, I definitely try to invest time, uh, you know, and, and really get to know my top performers in the Wikipedia article, which I encourage people to read. You know, they talk about it as being like a mentorship relationship. Now, I think everybody I think mentoring is a whole nother thing. I view it more as like, all right, if I've got, um, you know, 10 people on my team, which ones are really standing out that I think can be groomed for higher up positions, fast growth in the years ahead? Let me make sure I'm never skipping those weekly one on ones. Let me make sure I'm spending extra time with them. Let me make sure I'm sending them books that I have found helpful and interesting. Let me build that relationship and maybe even do a little socializing outside of the office. Um, So I just think it's in all the little things that are done that I don't necessarily do with someone who I think 
their performance is on the bubble. Now I'm not going to ignore them. You still want to coach, coach as much as you can, but you coach until there's the time when you give up and they have to go. Um, so it's just done in that daily moments, identifying your top performers and giving them extra time, extra opportunities, extra resources so that they can continue their growth journey. So, uh, and hey, thanks for teaching me something, Sarah. LMX, I like that. Hey, if I'm gonna ever like do a side hustle, like maybe I'm gonna become a DJ or um, I don't know, work on my rap game, maybe you guys should just call me like LMX. You know, we'll all know it's leader member exchange, but I, anyway. Okay, leadership ethics question from Oscar Martinez, Francisco Magana, Edwin Nuno. After failing time and time again at such a young age, you guys had to go there? I mean, oh my gosh, I'm just getting over this. I was just not getting upset and you had to remind me that I failed so young. How did you find the courage to become a great leader and turn a dream into a multi-million dollar technology company? Okay, courage is not the right word. Here's, here's the dealio. Um, primary motivators for humans, and it's all evolutionary, it's all biological, it's fear and love or pain and pleasure. But let's talk about fear and love. Now, fear is a much, much more powerful motivator than the positive stuff. And that's because, you know, uh, as we evolved, it's like, that's what needs to be fine tuned. We're picking berries. And if we hear the bushes rustling, we're going to fear it's a saber tooth lion that's going to kill us. And we're going to start running. You know, it, it, if, if love <laughs> was, was overriding fear and we're picking those berries and we hear some rustling, we're gonna think, Oh, Hey, maybe it's going to be a new best friend. Maybe it's going to be my mate for life. Let me go investigate the sound. No, that gets you killed. That gets you dead. So fear stomps out love in most cases, um, pain of avoiding pain, avoiding loss. So in decision making, you know, if, if you say, hey, you know, flip this coin or whatever, and you can either uh, uh, lose a dollar or, you know, win, win a dollar, you know, people fear that loss of a dollar more than the gain of a dollar. Um, you would really need to say lose the dollar or gain two or three dollars before we say, all right, I'm willing to risk the loss of a dollar because the pleasure of three dollars is so much better. So well, you called courage. Most people don't start their business, don't start writing that novel, don't go back to school or whatever, because they fear something. They fear they're going to fail. They fear they're not going to be able to do it and they're going to feel dumb or that it's going to be a waste of time or it's a waste of money. Very often and dig deep, my friends, they fear that the loved ones around them aren't going to support the decision. You know, wow. Um, and well, this is actually true. I didn't have this fear, but like I was the first kid in my family to go to college. Well, for a lot of people, you go back home at night <clears throat> and you're trying to study and all the rest and everybody else is watching TV or drinking beer or whatever, thinking you're, you know, getting all uppity on them. I mean, this is a common problem. Um, I've experienced not overt negativity, but like as my businesses have done better, as I've had books that hit the New York Times bestseller list, you know, my Facebook feed is like uh, crickets, right? Like people aren't really interacting with me that much. I'm, I came from one place. They're still there. I'm in a different place. Not everybody likes to see that. You become a mirror. So here's what I did. I fear failure. I still fear failure. I, I, feared failure when I started LeadX, even though I'd started many successful companies and I'm older now, I fear failure right now that LeadX will fail. After I'd failed a bunch of times in my 20s, I feared failure. But what did I fear more than failure? So it's not like, oh, but I love something, something so much. What did I fear more than failure? I feared being 90 years old and never having tried. I feared being 90 years old, sitting on that rocking chair and saying, huh, was that all life was about? That was pretty boring. You know, I feared not having adventure, not making an impact. I fear to this day dying and being insignificant. So that fear of insignificance, that fear of never living life trumps my fear of failure. And that is often what, you know, makes me um, go. And if that was really too dark and freaky for you, then pretend you didn't hear it and then flip it to love. And the way I would do it is like, this is true. My mission, you know, is to give people hope and help so that they can fulfill their full potential. And I do reflect on that every morning. So channel up the love as much as you can, but it's really about fear. All right. 
that is cool. I'm going to try to keep plowing through. This is going to be a longer Friday episode because I want to get more of these questions in from Professor June Covington students who are taking her leadership and motivation class at Chico State. So let's see. Here's one. Um, did I cover all these? Okay. Leadership behavioral approach from Lorenzo Rosetto. The question I have is on an article titled Seven Things I Learned from Building an AI Chatbot for Leadership Development. What kind of behavioral approach on the leadership grid are you using for Coach Amanda to help leaders? Um, one of the utterances is, how do you manage an employee who never comes in on time? Hey, and by the way, Lorenzo, you picked up on something. That's literally what the AI people call it. It's an utterance. How do you manage an employee who never comes in on time? What will Coach Amanda recommend? A more authority compliance area for results? Country club for maintaining relationships? Maybe a middle of the road approach? Okay, Lorenzo, so I do believe in um, individualizing our leadership approach, our management approach, the most famous model, I don't love it, but it's Ken Blanchard's situational leadership, you know, where you're, you know, more directive or um, uh, less directive, et cetera. Um, now, Coach Amanda is very limited at this time. So she's not so much um, like when you take a, a, an approach on a scale like that, you really need a lot of back and forth with your team member who is whatever it is. What was the um, uh, who never comes in on time? So Coach Amanda just gives you a very basic factual answer. So um, her answer to that question is, hey, most of these kinds of problems can be solved with effective feedback. In fact, that's her answer to almost almost anything you ask her employee problem, because that is the approach is employee feedback. And she gives you a simple model. Um, hey, leader, you state the behavior, you know, you've come, you know, very specifically, you've come in late three times this week. What's the impact? You've caused your colleagues to stay late plot or when they didn't, then customer service went down because the lines got long and then you get agreement. So, hey, do you under, do you agree you've been coming in late and you understand now how it's impacting people? Do you agree you're going to come in on time all all week next week? So, Behavior, impact, get agreement. So she, Coach Amanda kind of goes into teaching mode and gives you a model. And you can say, she then says like, do you want to see an example of that conversation? You say, yes, she gives you a little example. So that feedback conversation is a simple model that she's teaching you. And I'm not sure where you would place that on the grid. It's certainly not a um, progressive punishment model where it's like, this is the third time, therefore you get three demerits. So I'm going to smack you on the, you know, hand with a ruler. Um, so it's a little bit more, uh, you know, um, supportive, but the reality is there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, before you would even give that feedback, it would start like great executive coaches would tell you to start with, with context, you know, where, um, you would find out, like you would think about again, is this person late five days in a row or the first time in a year? And then you just ask, Hey, you know, what's going on? Notice came in late and just ask them what is going on before you go into that feedback mode. So I think her answers are a little bit directive, um, but not entirely. And it's just a limitation of the technology uh, for now. All right, we got a question from Jade Penrod. Donna Arellano, Ar Ar Arellano, sorry about that. Janae Lambert, Trevor Harrison, Mr. Cruz. All right, hold on a sec, I gotta get my dad on the phone. Um, adaptive leadership helps individuals adapt and thrive in challenging environments. How have you used adaptive leadership to overcome some of the challenges you have faced in your life? Okay, so I don't know if I'm going, to, again, I'm, I'm not an academic, so I don't know if my response here is to the kind of adaptive leadership you're talking about. But in terms of, um, you know, being flexible, being adaptive, and I do believe like adaptability is a core trait for for success in the future, like more than ever before, because change is so uh, rapid right now that anybody at work, like you just have to be able to adapt your environment. You know, it, it's the, the Darwin's law. It's not that the fastest will survive because uh, there's times when you are going to need to stay still and hide from the predator. It's not that the strongest will survive. Sometimes you need to be quick or nimble. It's those who adapt, who are the most adaptable will survive so that you can thrive in, you know, evolutionary terms in hot and cold. And uh, uh, humans are very adaptable for food. That's why in some areas we were meat eaters. But 
good news, vegans, vegetarians, in other parts of the world, we didn't eat meat at all. We were, we were you know, eating uh, plants and stuff. So um, adaptability is really the number one thing you want. And as an individual and as a company, um, I, I believe in this strongly. So company-wise, the way I think about it is we need to remain true to our mission but totally flexible in our approach to getting there. So, you know, like just an extreme example, if like right now we want to get 100 million next, we want to get the next 100 million leaders pumped up on leadership. And I think the way to do that is by releasing this AI coach. But I'm true to the mission of supporting leaders around the world. I'm very flexible on our approach. If the marketplace tells us that, hey, we really don't care about uh, AI executive coaches. Instead, you need to, I don't know, invent better French fries and mail everybody a bunch of French fries. Well, then guess what? We will be the best French fry producer in the world if that is truly how we're going to create great leaders. Now, I doubt that's the method, but like I would do anything. It's stay true to your vision, to your mission, to your to your big goal and then stay flexible and keep pivoting, keep experimenting on your path, zigging and zagging until you get there. And on an individual level, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, um, people get frustrated because it's so hard to change, like, you know, lose weight, you know, whatever it is, let's say, it is, let's say it's that, lose weight. There's a million ways to do it, you know, eat less, exercise more uh, within exercise, you know, are you gonna do the uh, the low reps, heavy weights? Or are you gonna do the high impact? Or are you gonna do, everybody's got their theory. Food, oh, it should be paleo. No, it shouldn't be paleo, it should be this. You know, there's, everybody's got their ideas. And I think people get frustrated when it's like, oh, I'm gonna do this diet because I need to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks. And they get halfway through it and it's like, oh shoot, I'm not losing any weight, like nothing works. I get depressed, it's not working, I just stop. And the reality is you gotta find what works for you. You know, just because everybody tells you exercising first thing in the morning is what lifetime exercise people do, look, try it. And if it doesn't work for you, don't say, oh, I, I, I suck, I'm horrible, I'm, I'm never gonna get this. It's like, all right, well, let me try exercising at night. Let me try playing tennis during lunch. Let me try speed walking. You know, let me go for a hike on Sunday. There's so many things we can do. And same with career. You know, my, my kids are in college, right? And so it's like, they're sweating these big decisions. Do they take this internship or that? Do they go to, um, uh, you know, a semester abroad or not? And it's like, yeah, think it through and make a decision, but it doesn't really matter. Like make the best of each decision knowing that you can pivot and do something else or try something else, including picking your major, by the way. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful at some level. Okay, and we have another question from the same group. Uh, followership is a process whereby an individual or individuals accept the influence of others to accomplish a common goal. In what ways do you gain followers? Um, listen, for myself, to me, um, I just tried to provide value. I just try to be helpful. So in the bigger world, when I'm trying to gain followers, which is readers of my book, listeners of my podcast, uh, buyers of Coach Amanda, I'm just trying to provide value. I'm trying to help people. And to be honest, I think in the workplace, it's the same thing. It's servant leadership. If you show up at work every day and love at a love for humankind level, your team members, and remember, you don't need to like people in order to love them, but you love them and care about them and care about their families and their kids, then you naturally want to help them to do their job better. You want to help them to succeed. You want to help them to get promoted. And just coming from that place, people pick up on that and will, you know, uh, will generally uh, follow you. All right, we're going to keep rolling. This is going to become a marathon episode. And let's see the next question. Servant leadership from... Betsy Yara, Candia Garcia, when one is in the servant leadership role, an important part of success with the changes that come with it is if the team member or members are open to being guided, supported, et cetera. How does one who is in the servant leadership role handle situations when a team member or members are not willing to cooperate? Yeah, so, I mean, I think um, all of this stuff starts in the hiring process. So whatever your screening, your interviewing selection process is, you want to try to find team members who are coachable, uh, who have a growth mindset, um, who are ambitious and aligned with your company values and, and wanna work in that framework. 
and you can um, uh, there are like psych psychological tests, personality assessments that you can give to people in that process. They kind of indicate uh, their personality. I just heard yesterday a tech entrepreneur say in all of his interviews, coachability, he thinks is the number one factor. And so they do a role play where he has them do this little exercise uh, in, in the interview. Maybe it's a second interview. I don't know. Then he gives them feedback on how to change it, how to make it better. And then he asks them to do it again. And those who really listened and tried are highly coachable. Those who like did the same thing or kind of argue with them that their way was better are not coachable. So, I mean, there's ways you can screen for it. Once they are in, I think, um, I mean, look, you know, you try as hard as you can to, to give feedback and to uh, remind people of the common goals. Look, we're, well, we all have this mission. We're all working towards this goal. We're in this together. And I'm giving you feedback from a place of caring, not a place of punishment. And you keep at it. But if at a certain point, they're not playing, they're not, they're not co-creating the future with you, fire them. <laughs> they're on the wrong team. I shouldn't say fire them. Uh, <laughs> co-create their next employment opportunity. How about that? I'm going to use that line more often. Um, let's see. So here's another one. Leadership skills approach question from Tony Pisciata, Lisa Vieira, and Stephanie Warden. According to Katz, the three skills that leaders need are technical, human, and conceptual. In your experience, which of the three skills is most crucial to achieving high levels of employee engagement? What major life event had the greatest impact on forming your definition of leadership? Okay, well, it's funny. I was just drinking beer with Katz the other day. All right, no, I wasn't. I don't know who Katz is. So let me think about this for just a second. Okay, so I just Googled uh, Katz's three skills approach and immediately on the Penn State uh, website, they've got a nice grid that shows these three skills, but it also says there's different skill or different categories based on whether you're a frontline manager, you know, the uh, supervisory early manager or middle manager or a senior executive, a top manager, which makes sense to me. You know, when you're a frontline manager, your technical skills matter a lot. Uh, they say your human skills mad, man, um, matter a lot, but your conceptual, not so much. And then like, as you go higher up in the organization, the CEO doesn't need technical skills that much, but they still need the same human. They need a lot more conceptual skills. And I, I would tend to agree with this. Now, I think of this approach, and this is what we use in the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda, is, um, you know, you're a frontline, you're a middle manager, or you're a senior executive, and your competencies sort of change and evolve in that area. So at the very basic leadership competency model, it's self-leadership. So it's things like productivity, self-awareness, controlling your emotions. One level up was going to be leading others. And so that's going to be the human stuff in this model, the people's part of it. Um, and then, you know, when you when you get up into uh, middle management, it's like leading the function, leading the department, the business unit. And so now, you know, um, it's a little bit different. You, your, your technical skills, quote unquote, need to be things like budgets and forecasting and planning. Um, and then at the highest level, you still need technical skills, uh, but it's more like um, decision making and strategy. Um, and maybe they would call that conceptual skills, perhaps. So that would make sense. In my view, the human part is always number one. The technical stuff, first of all, can be learned. So technical stuff, you just learn it. You just put the time in. Um, if you don't know something, you don't know it yet, as uh, everybody likes to say. Growth mindset. Uh, and But the human stuff, I mean, whether you are trying to influence people without a title, so you're not even a manager yet, or you're leading your team, you're trying to engage your team, that's the human stuff. When you're a middle manager, you're still going to have five to 10 people managing you and how you lead them impacts how they lead others. So if anything, it's more important. Same thing at the CEO level, you're now trying to influence, to lead vice presidents and board of directors, very successful, smart influential people. I think the human stuff is paramount. And I'll just go back um, again, when it comes to engagement, it's growth, it's recognition, it's trust. Uh, there's specific things like, you know, giving effective feedback. Um, but it starts actually with self-awareness. You know, if you don't have any awareness of how you're coming off or who you are, it's kind of hard to 
adjust and individualize your approach to others. But anyway, I, I appreciate that. I wasn't familiar with the three skills approach. And um, so you guys are you guys are literally taking me to school, remote distance learning kind of school. All right. I think this is the last one. And it's a tough one. Gender and leadership. Olivia Lacuga Aguilar. Do you think the gender stereotypes against women in the workplace contribute to issues related to the glass ceiling that we still see today? What do you suggest we can do to combat the issue and gain more equality between men and women? Yes, Olivia, I wish it wasn't true. The, the stereotypes are there. The glass ceiling is there. It's a very tough issue, and um, we have to attack it from a lot of angles. So, for example... I mean, it's just horrible, like the the low representation of women in uh, engineering and, and STEM sciences. And, you know, from my limited understanding of the issue and research of the issue, you know, it's it's now uh, everyone's talking about and I've spoke I've interviewed like on the podcast, like VP of HR at Red Hat Technology, uh, a woman. And this issue is very important to her. And she's the first to say, like, listen, you know, when you're trying to find a senior programmer, and you've got 10 candidates and nine of them are men and only one's a woman, it's tough to, um, uh, you know, get equal one-to-one equality in gender on all this when it's like nine-to-one in terms of the candidates. So you need to make the candidate pool um, uh, have parity in order to have your employee pool have parity. And people are going back and saying, you really need to get in this particular issue, like if we can get to uh, girls in the fourth grade or earlier realizing that like science is cool, science makes money, teachers, you need to call on the girls who are raising their hand to answer math questions just as often as you do uh, to boys. If there's somehow we can get that early and push through that like, you know, oh, it's not cool to to be a, a math nerd, you know, in middle school and high school and boys won't like me, like we gotta overcome all that. Um, you got to get that interest early. And so I think people are doing a much better job of that, but it's going to take time to kind of move through the system. More importantly, though, you know, whether with any um, diversity issue in terms of candidates, uh, you know, the people who don't get it, the, the like old school idiots about this will be like, oh, you know, uh, um, there's one uh, uh, one woman, nine men, but I have to pick her or so-and-so had to pick her, you know, because of this parity issue. That's not that's not what's going on. That's not what anybody's saying. If this is the case, what it means is you have to try extra hard to recruit women. So maybe you put up a sign on your lawn and you get nine men who want that job. Well, oh, you got to go dig and fight and reach out to women to get them to apply so that you've got more representation. And I will tell you, like, this is hard because so I was um, last year. I was putting together the uh, Scaling Leadership Conference in Philadelphia, and uh, gender parity is very important to me. And so I tried very hard, like, look, we should have as many, if not more, women speakers on stage as men. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. And so here's what happened. I would literally identify 10 men who I wanted to come and invite directors of leadership development um, to come and present. Reached out to 10 and about seven said, yes, I will do it. Or assuming my schedule, I will do it. I, and I'm not making these numbers up. Reached out to 10 women. One woman said she would do it. All the rest said they wouldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And I've seen this over and over again. And if you, again, look at the, le- the, the, the literature on gender and identity, there's often a confidence thing. Men you know, <laughs> have this foolish confidence like, hey, the, the job says I need these 10 attributes. I've got half of them. I'm going to apply. You know, they think half is good. (laughs) Glass is half full. A a woman could have nine of the 10 attributes. Like, Oh, bummer. I don't have the 10th attribute. I can't apply. It's a different mindset. And so like all of us who are, whether we're, we're promoting within, whether we're recruiting people into roles, whether we're trying to put a panel together, we need to try extra hard to reach out to the candidates, to find them to reach out to them, to convince them it's worth doing, to worth applying to. Um, Anybody who's had some level of success should, and I don't just mean women, you know, so if you are a VP in an organization, think about how you can mentor young, high potential women in your organization to guide them along, to help them to have the experiences that are going to count, to meet people, to give them confidence. So it's like so many levels we got to work on this from 
uh, women themselves, like putting themselves out there and going for it to all of us who should be mentoring and supporting others and then just recruiting more people at that level. Um, such an important issue, such a hard issue. And uh, thanks for, for answering that question, Olivia. And thanks, everybody. Hey, uh, so Dr. June, you are awesome with what you do with the students year after year, and you are so creative. And I've loved working with you remotely. Big apologies again, this hit at the wrong time. So these are probably late, but I wanted to get these out. So maybe you can send them on to your students if they've already graduated or you're not even talking about this stuff anymore. And maybe the answers will be useful um, to your students who, uh, you know, who take the class again in the future. Thanks everyone. And remember, you are a leader, whether you want to be or not, because leadership is influence. It's a Friday. How are you going to lead your family, your friends this weekend?